This is Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Let's get into it. All right, guys, we've got a special guest on the podcast today. His name is Raymond Ibrahim. So he's an author, translator, columnist, and vocal critic of Islam. He's also an expert in Islamic history and doctrine. He was actually born in the United States to Coptic immigrants from Egypt, and that kind of leads us into a discussion of how he became fluent in both English and Arabic. He also did his master's thesis under Victor Davis Hanson, who's now at the Hoover Institution. Most of you should be aware of him. But he is the author of multiple books, including Crucified Again, Exposing Islam's New War on Christians, Sword and Scimitar, 14 Centuries of War Between Islam and the West, and his newest book, which is an absolute banger called Defenders of the West, The Christian Heroes Who Stood Against Islam. And in this discussion today, we talk about Islam a lot because it's really the center point of why we want to even get into this discussion. But when I found out that Defenders of the West was even a book that was on the market, I wanted to have Raymond on because he spent his entire life basically taking the slings and arrows of being critical of Islam. But he's coming at it from a very informed point of view. And so he understands the history, understands the religious aspect, and he understands how it spreads. And so for him, as a self-described Christian, which we talk about in this particular episode, we talk about how he gained interest in this. But also, overall, why the West is so confused about Islam, how we just look at the things like the English verses, the English translations of the Quran, or these peaceful verses, and we think, oh, well, that's what Islam is. And when Islamist extremists do something, and they're, they're not really extremists, they're fundamentalists, when they do these crazy things, we think, oh, well, that just, that isn't a reflection of Islam, even though that's exactly what it is. Because we talk about the ninth surah being the least abrogated of all the texts left by Muhammad. These are basically his final marching orders, and how that basically demands that Muslims perform jihad and to kill the infidels. Right. So in this discussion today, we talk about all that, but then we talk about the men that he writes about in this book. We talk about Duke Godfrey, the Cid, King Richard. We spent a lot of time talking about King Richard, but then also St. Ferdinand, St. Louis, John Hunyadi, Skanderbeg and Vlad Dracula. And in the discussion of these men, we get into a discussion about Christian pacifism. And how Christian pacifism basically doesn't have a corollary within Islam or the Quran or the Hadith or any of those types of things. We talk about how the West has been lulled to sleep into thinking that Islam is not really a big deal. You know, yeah, there's these flare-ups where they, you know, kill a thousand Jews, uh, the most Jews killed at any time since the Holocaust. But, you know, that's not really indicative of Islam. And so we don't understand our enemy. And then we also don't feel like we have any reason to fight. Right. So it's like, oh, we shouldn't really fight back about against these ideologies. We shouldn't really we should just be pacifistic. And if, you know, a Muslim wants to come into my house and perform jihad on me and chop my head off and then rape my wife and kids and then burn them alive, like, ah, you know, I really shouldn't fight against that. And it really goes into this discussion about how Christianity and modernity is not really a muscular religion anymore. We bought into this idea that Jesus is this hippie that just wants what's best for you and thinks you're cute and wonderful and, you know, just come as you are and it's no big deal. And with, that's just completely divorced from what we see from the, the men specifically that he's highlighted in this book. And then, again, we get into a lot of detail about King Richard, but I was very, very excited to talk to him and it really exceeded my expectations. I really enjoyed my time with him, so I'm not going to keep him from you any longer. So without further ado, let's get into it. Raymond Ibrahim, welcome to Undaunted Life of Man's podcast. Hi, Kyle. Good to be with you. I'm very excited to talk with you today as we were talking just off air just a second ago. The stuff that you've covered is not really something that I've covered on the show, so we're creeping up on 600 episodes. And I've talked a lot about Islam and I've talked about different things, but certainly not to the level that you have written or spoken about it before. But we can't just race there. we got to start small. So let's start with your upbringing. So you were born here and raised in the United States, but you were born to Coptic immigrants from Egypt. And so talk to me a little bit about that. Like, what was it like growing up for you? Were you uh, around Arabic speaking and English speaking, both sides uh, from, you know, both sides of the family as you were growing up? Tell, tell us a little bit about that. Sure, you're right. That's the background. Uh, the, for those who don't know, Copts are not Copts. They're, uh, they're the indigenous Christians of Egypt, um, the original inhabitants for the Muslim conquest, the Arab conquest in the 7th century. And uh, correct, my parents uh, immigrated from there. And I was born here. Um, I, I grew up. Uh, uh, the Arabic speakers, actually, back then, when I was young, um, it was very limited. I didn't know many Arab speakers or Arabs uh, in general, not in the places I lived in. Um, even though nowadays, a lot of, you know, there's a huge community, both of Copts and Arabs and Muslims um, in, 
in America in certain areas. So no, I didn't. I didn't. The, the extent of the Arab speakers I knew really were my parents, um, and um, my extended family was mostly mostly not. It's back in Egypt or other countries around the world. Um, I, but what it did do for me, I think, is uh, made me really interested in that nexus between Islam and Christianity. So being raised as a, as a Christian in America and hearing stories and being familiar with the background of what happened to Christians in Egypt naturally made me interested in the general, um, you know, relationship and conflict between those two civilizations. And so was that an interest that was kindled like as a child, because you are now, you know, fluent Arabic and English, uh, you're, you're literally a linguist. So is that, did it really start there from childhood or I guess, how did that develop as you were going through your formal education? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I spoke Arabic, uh, I spoke Arabic, um, but I didn't learn to read or write it until much, much later uh, in college. Uh, I studied it formally. Uh, and it's, it's, you'd be surprised at the differences between, you know, the, the vernaculars that different Arab nations and Arab speakers speak compared to the original writing. So it was actually not an easy task, um, as one might imagine, but of course, easier for, than for someone who doesn't know anything at all. Right. Um, <clears throat> And um, I actually, I, probably also because of the fact that I was bilingual, it, I, I developed an interest in languages in general. And so I did study a fair bit of languages in college and just for fun. I, I studied, I, I did a fair bit of hieroglyphic studying on mm. my own, for example, Coptic, Greek, a little bit of Latin. Most of the languages I delved in are really dead right now. Um, and so when I say Greek, I mean classical, Koine Greek, ancient Greek. Uh, but yeah, so all of that, I just, I've always had, a, the bottom line is I really had an interest in history and, and the further back it goes, the more interesting it is for me. And the more it had elements that pertain to me, like I mentioned, the Christian Muslim thing, obviously that also sparked an interest. And so for you personally, because uh, we'll get into your newest book, Defenders of the West here in a second. But if I remember correctly, while reading it, you said, I'm not a Catholic, nor am I a Protestant. And you kind of left it there. So in terms of your personal faith, uh, where do you land? Because I, I didn't really see that in any of my research in terms of what you personally believe, because you've spent a lot of time in between the worlds of Christianity and Islam. But ha where have you landed? Well, I'm, I was baptized in the Coptic Orthodox mm. Church, so I would technically be Orthodox. Uh, that would be my formal um, designation. My personal beliefs are I, are akin to Orthodoxy, but I, you know, I'm definitely not a good Orthodox in the sense that, uh, you know, Orthodoxy is a very demanding religion mm. uh, if you want to follow it ritual, uh, you know, very closely. Um, and I think it's inevitable for anyone, Catholic, Orthodox, or whatever, who's born and raised in the West not to have some sort of Protestant influence um, on the, on them. And so in my mind, you know, the Bible is very important and everything else is sort of secondary. So it's, I think it's a little, uh, an, it's an amalgamation a bit, but formally I would say I'm an Orthodox. Well, it's interesting you say it that way because, you know, I, I know a little bit about Orthodox. I know quite a bit more about Catholicism, but you're right. A lot of them, they don't look at the word of God as kind of being the final say. It's like, okay, the word of God plus the early church fathers, plus tradition, plus whatever the church made up and like, or, you know, decided they were going to do at mm -hmm. some point. And there's not a whole lot of substantiation for it. But at the end of the day, being a Christian, regardless of your flavor of it, comes back to the person of Jesus Christ and whether or not you believe that a Middle Eastern Jewish carpenter died on a cross and was resurrected three days later to pay for your sins. Ultimately, that's that's what makes a Christian. Everything else is seemingly window dressing. But we really need... Which, by the way, which, which, by the way, you know, just to add to that... I'm glad you say that because in Defenders of the West, the book we're discussing, um, I, I try to uh, I anticipate the question because the subtitle of the book is The Christian Heroes mm -hmm. Who Defended uh, the West Against Islam. And so I say, so what makes them Christian? And I get into it. And really, that's the bottom line, what you just said. And even though it manifested itself, obviously, differently in those days, you know, in, pre in the pre-modern era, Christianity, while I would agree with what you said about the belief in Christ, um, manifested itself in a much more physical way, and I don't just mean violently. I mean, uh, I, I mean, it, it was a material thing. It was obvious. It was, you know. So that's what I use the criterion. If they said they were Christian and they went to church and um, you know they professed to Jesus, etc., then to me that was good enough to make them Christian. Yeah. So Christian. here in a second, when we go through who is 
titled or who is detailed in this book, there's one name in particular that people would be shocked to know. And I think it's going to be very, very obvious which one uh, people would be shocked to know, at least identified as a Christian. But you, Raymond, you're a very vocal and outspoken critic of Islam and a public critic of Islam, which kind of makes you persona non grata for any Muslim circles and also could make you a target. Uh, But in 2007, you released something called the Al Qaeda Reader. And so this is what Victor Davis Hanson, uh, who wrote the the foreword of your new book, the way he put it was this, quote, revealed to Western readers the sharp dichotomy between the terrorist filtered Islamism that appeared in English and their fiery jihadism they spoke and composed in Aramaic to inflame their own constituencies. Obviously, that's, that's a crazy quote, but very, very accurate. We've gotten this thing where when you see anything quoted from the Quran, on major news media or blogs or something like that. It's always the peaceful verses and the verses who are um, basically the most abrogated verses, I guess would be the easy way to say it. I talk about the ninth surah of the Quran a lot, saying that's the least abrogated surah. This is basically the last commands that we get from Muhammad to Muslims, and it's the bloodiest surah. Uh, arguably, of the entire Quran. And there's another thing that you specifically put in the book here, and it's Surah 9, verse 5. Kill the idolaters, those are non-Muslims, wherever you find them, capture them, besiege them, and sit and wait for them at every place of ambush. And so what we've seen really in the last few months, we've seen what Hamas did in Israel. But then the thing I did on my show here, I know I'm I'm taking a while to set this up, but I want to tee you up properly. I, I talked about on my show not just about the atrocities that happened in Israel, but why they were doing them and what was in the Hamas charter and what the the words of Muhammad are, are I guess you could say the, the words of, of Gabriel or whatever, but the, the words of Muhammad is put down in the Quran or the Hadith or any of the other traditions and kind of why they're doing these things. And the reason why I said is because guys, within a couple of weeks, people are going to say, why is Israel being so mean? Uh, you know, what about all the peaceful Muslims? All my Muslim friends are peaceful. They're, you're going to start hearing these things that are attached to kind of like a sanitized version of what Islam really is. So, again, I apologize for going into that long of an explanation. But talk to me a little bit about as a public critic of Islam, how you deal with so many ignorant English speaking Westerners that don't really understand the the depravity of the worldview. Yeah. Uh, so I've been in this business for quite a while. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the book you mentioned, the Al Qaeda reader came out in 2007, but really I was writing and publishing in this, in about the topic of radical Islam and the historical aspects since, uh, about 2001, you know, so over 20 years and that book, the whole point of it was I was working with the library of Congress at the time. And, uh, I came across, uh, and I, I worked with Arabic materials. And by the way, you, you were quoting Victor Davis Hanson and you said, I don't know, I think, the, I don't know where you got the quote, but you said the books were in Aramaic. It's in Arabic. Yeah, cor- correct. That's I misspoke. I yes. Okay. 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 Just to, because I, if that's written somewhere, that needs to be fixed. No, it, it anyway, definitely wasn't. It only needs to be fixed in my brain whenever it comes out of my face. Oh, okay. So okay. Thank okay, you, okay, thank okay, you for okay. very slyly Con- correcting me. I appreciate it. Slip of the tongue. That's right. Slip of the tongue. Okay. No problem. Um, so uh, those Arabic texts that I discovered were written by Al Qaeda. And I, and they weren't even uh, classified yet. They were in tubs and bins. And um, when I read them, basically what, what they said, the whole message was completely different than the communiques that Al Qaeda was sending to the West and were being disseminated and published and translated by BBC, CNN, et cetera, et cetera. And those latter ones that were being published and disseminated were all about how Al Qaeda is attacking the West and everyone else, Israel, because the West and Israel are the aggressors. Okay, the, the, the narrative that we're familiar with, obviously, and, you know, you attacked us first, so we're attacking you. The Arabic writings that I found and which were after I translated and were published as the Al-Qaeda reader said the exact opposite. And they and they were directed to fellow Muslims. And but basically what they said is what ISIS or the Islamic State says, which is that America and Israel are our enemies first and foremost because they're non-Muslims, because they're infidels. It doesn't even matter what they do, mm. whether they're good, bad, oppressive, etc., they're, they're, they're existential enemies that must be fought to the end. Um, so that was the whole point in bringing that out. And I found them in 2005, it was published in 2007. And you're right, you would have thought it would create some sort of shift. And obviously, I believe it did open many eyes. Um, but it's still, you know, the debate, only recently, you might remember a few months ago, um, someone posted uh, Osama bin Laden's letter yeah. to the Americans. It went viral. And, and it went viral. And everyone was, wow, see, 
uh, Al Qaeda and mu radical Muslims, their whole point is they're angry at what's happening to Palestinians. And again, actually, that letter was in the Al Qaeda reader. I, I put up, I put it in, just to show the difference of what they were saying to the West, and then showing as they spoke to Muslims how they were saying, no, that that's secondary. We don't even care. They have to be fought no matter what because they're not Muslim. Um, so yeah, that's definitely that's definitely the case. Uh, that is scriptural, doctrinal Islam, and as we'll see, it manifested itself historically as well. So there's nothing aberrant about it. The Muslim that you know down the street, you know, the Joe Blow or mm. Muhammad Blow, that, that's a nice guy, right? Um, I don't discount that. They exist, obviously, but they're not representatives of the religion. Right. The religion can be dissected, as I've done, and it could be assessed and um, understood for itself. But obviously, with all religions, whoever the practitioners are, they can say whatever they want. That doesn't, that's not necessarily a reflection of the religion. Like when you get a Christian who says, yeah, I'm homosexual. And I think that's, you know, that's definitely, and I think God approves of that, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, they can do that. They exist. Does that mean that's what Christianity is? Obviously not. Same thing with Islam. Yeah, there's a lot of things I've heard before. I think Frank Turk said it to where it's like, okay, if somebody is playing Beethoven on the piano and they're doing a poor job, you don't blame Beethoven. You have to go back to the source material. It's like, you know, the guy in Guitar Center trying to, trying to play Guns N' Roses. It's like if he does a crappy job, you don't blame Slash. But the same thing is true. Like when someone's a secular Jew, they're not a representative of, of Judaism, right? They're They're checking a box as if they were, you know, doing it before going into, you know, some place that they need to fill out their, their generalized information. Like they're just checking a box. They're not representative of it. And that's why I also don't like the language around Muslim extremism using air quotes, because when you look at examples of quote unquote, Muslim extremism by Al Qaeda or ISIS or Boko Haram or the Houthis or, or any of these types of groups, they're not extremists when they're doing exactly what their source material is telling them to do and to act in these ways. And, and the thing that I found, Defenders of the West is the most interesting book I've read so far this year. We're still early in the year, but it's just a fantastic read, is you're reading stories about things that happened, in some cases, over a millennia ago, and they sound like they could have been taken out of the pages of the news from last October, right? It's the same exact things as they're screaming Allahu, Allahu Akbar, as they're raping and beheading people. It's like, oh, this is just the way that it's been from the beginning. But let's go ahead and get into our discussion of Defenders of the West. Again, the book, Defenders of the West, The Christian Heroes Who Stood Against Islam. So just generically, because we will get into a lot of detail, I want to know why you specifically wrote this book. And also, uh, Sword, uh, Sword and Scimitar is another book that you wrote. And I believe from the intro you said, hey, these two can kind of be read alongside one another, but one focuses on decisive battles versus the other focusing on decisive men. And then also, why did you focus on the men listed here? And I'll go ahead and give the list of the men highlighted here. Duke Godfrey, the Cid, King Richard, more on him later, St. Ferdinand, St. Louis, John Hunyadi, Skanderberg or Skanderbeg and then Vlad Dracula, right? So that's the one that's going to be a shock to most people. So why write the book? Why focus on the way that you did and why focus on these specific men? Yeah. So the reason I wrote Defenders of the West and actually before I can even talk about it, we have to talk about its predecessor, which you also mentioned, Sword and Scimitar. Um, and the subtitle clarifies what it's about. 14 centuries of war between Islam and the West. Um, I have it here. That's a good one. Um, I, I, yeah, I was, so this one came out in 2018 and that book, um, as you mentioned, it goes, to, it, it looks at battles, uh, decisive battles and the oftentimes cataclysmic impact it had on the development of the old world, Europe and so and Christendom. Um, and I saw from the very beginning, the first battle is in the year 636, Yarmouk, first decisive battle. All, all throughout the book, there's smaller battles, uh, but I look at the major battles. Um, and ironically enough, the Battle of Yarmouk, 636, was my master's thesis. It was, uh, was about that, uh, in, mm. which came out in 2001, I think. And um, Victor Davis Hanson, military historian, was the actual chair of it. So that's interesting. It just it, you know, shows you I've been in this history aspect for quite some time. And then in the final battle, just to fast forward, the eighth, the eighth battle is in 1683, the Siege of Vienna. So that's over a thousand years right there. But I also go into uh, closer to our times, including America's first war as a nation, which was with Muslims, the Barbary Wars. And, uh, you know, you were mentioning Surah or, or, or chapter nine of the Quran, nine five, which is known in Arabic as Ayat al-Sif, which means the, the, the verse of the sword. 
um, which says, as, uh, to paraphrase, you know, you lie in wait in ambush, fight the fight the disbelievers, the unbelievers, the infidels, whatever you want to call them, however you want to translate it, um, and, and lay in ambush, et cetera, et cetera. So Thomas Jefferson and John Adams, when they met with the ambassador of Barbary and asked them, why have you been attacking our vessels and enslaving and torturing our sailors? That's exactly how the uh, the ambassador responded. He paraphrased that particular verse. Mm. Uh, so that's now 1,200 years after Muhammad. So it gives you an idea um, of how continuous this logic that we're told, of course, is not Islam, uh, was and how it manifested itself all throughout uh, you know, century and century in different regions of the world. At any rate, so that's sort of scimitar, and uh, we can talk a little more about that later because, you know, again, the way it intersects with Defenders of the West is pretty interesting. They complement one, one another. Defenders of the West, I decided to take a different tack, and instead of, in eight chapters, instead of looking at decisive battles, I looked at decisive men. And so this, this is more of a, you know, a take on spirit and motivation of the actual warriors who fought and defended the Christian West from Islam and Islamic invasions. And uh, it's essentially each chapter of the eight is a, is a biography, a short biography of their lives, highlighting and mostly focusing on their on the conflicts with Islam. And I just thought it would be a, a great compliment to Sword and Scimitar to just show you the motivation, what compelled these men, um, what was, you know, and as I, as I discussed a little bit in the introduction, you know, <clears throat> the West today is far stronger militarily, economically, uh, in, in all ways, technologically, than its predecessor, Christendom. And yet, you know, here we are always being terrorized by Muslims who are immensely weak uh, compared to the West today. When you, uh, if you go back in time, of course, the Muslim world was the strong horse, as it were, and it was the power, it was, it was the superpower at the time. I mean, I think the Ottoman Empire, for example. Um, and yet, small Europe, embattled Europe, managed to survive and for me, the answer is because of these types of men and what motivated them and how they saw the world. So I thought that would be a very interesting lesson um, to go along with uh, Sword and Scimitar. And as for, I think you were asking about, you know, the uh, selection process. I just, you know, who to, who to highlight, which heroes. Um, I, I go into some uh, depth in the introduction explaining it, but the short of, long and short of it is, one, I didn't want to bring in men that I already discussed in Sword and Scimitar, because in Sword and Scimitar, there's obviously a lot of Christian heroes. And, um, you know, uh, and a lot of those guys could have made it in the book, but I just, you know, with a fresh blank page, I didn't want to regurgitate what I had written, because I know a lot of people who will read Defenders of the West had read Sword and Scimitar. So one of my criterion was, you know, not to be redundant and to pick different characters from the first book. Um, and then after that, it was just, uh, and it's, I, I got to tell you, it's a large, it's a large pool to select from, you know, there, we, one could technically write volumes uh, mm. on just these types of men, just as one can write volumes about the battles uh, between Islam and the West. Um, so in the end, I really, I, you know, I just picked the ones that I thought would resonate the most. And I tried to get also a, uh, you know, a wide net. So they're not all, you know, from Spain or they're not all from the Balkans. So I, it, it ended up with two from Spain, three from the Balkans and, um, uh, two crusaders, uh, sorry, three crusaders. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm losing count. Yeah. Three crusaders. Yeah. Okay. Um, and again, you know, and, and the crusades, you must keep in mind, the book is called defenders, defenders of the West, the Christians who stood against Islam. When you hear the crusades, of course, people think, well, wait, that's Christians invading Muslim territory. But of course you have to understand the backdrop and the history, which is that Muslim territory, the Holy land was Christian centuries before Islam conquered it ruthlessly. Jerusalem conquered around 637, and the Christians knew that, and Muslims were moreover, um, uh, there was a new rise of persecution at the hands of the Seljuk Turks, especially um, with vast, you know, the, the carnage was horrific, especially in Eastern Asia Minor, Armenians, Greeks, and, uh, you know, that's what propelled the crusade. So it was understood in the context of just war theory. Um, that's Christian territory that's under occupation, and Christians are being persecuted. So even though they're traveling there, they were actually defending and liberating in that sense. 
Right. And if we have time, I want to get more into a lot of that later. You mentioned the introduction. The introduction of this book is fantastic. In between the foreword written by Victor David Hansen and the introduction, there's a lot of stuff that you all bring up. And the first thing I want to talk about is really this idea of Christian pacifism. So Victor David Hansen again said in the book, Western pacifism has no counterpart in the Quran and the Hadith. So the Quran is, you know, According to them, the words of Allah and the Hadith are basically the collection of the the traditions and the writings uh, and observations of Muhammad in his life and some other things beyond that. But then you put three different scripture, holy Bible scripture references before the introduction of the book. The first is Luke twenty two thirty six. This is Jesus. He hath no sword, or he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and go buy one. And then Proverbs twenty five twenty six. Let a trampled spring and a polluted well, uh, or like a trampled spring and a polluted well. Is a righteous man who gives way before the wicked. Let's see if I can get the last one right. Psalm 144, 1. Praise be to the Lord, my rock. He trains my hands for war, my fingers for battle. So talk to me a little bit about this idea because I've literally done debates with people that are anti-gun, anti-violence, Christian pacifist activists. And they think that there basically is never, there's certainly no such thing as a just war but that there's never a time when you should use your physicality to hurt another image bearer of God, because Jesus said, turn the cheek once, even though they, they completely ignore the entire context of that situation and what was being communicated there. But it is one of those more frustrating things for guys like me and guys that listen to this podcast to where it's like, wait a minute. Like if somebody is being violated, if somebody is being destroyed, it is incumbent upon me as a Christian to use my physicality to stop that. But a lot of people just brain dead operate through the world saying, no, it's gotta be bad somehow. So talk to me a little bit about Christian pacifism. Yeah, this is, this whole topic is of interest uh, to me also because I think it's very important for the modern era. And I think this idea of Christian pacifism has been enabled and sponsored by forces that are just very hostile to Christianity um, because they want to get the message out that you as a Christian, who are who is our enemy but they don't say that we need you to do nothing and to say nothing and to shut up and to forgive and turn the other cheek and be a doormat obviously that's the best position to have your enemy in right to convince him that his job is to do absolutely nothing uh so i think that's why you see this message just being propagated all around including from wolves in sheep's clothing uh you know that is to say christian leaders and pastors etc cetera, etc cetera, who whether it's because they're naive or intentionally doing this you know, you probably have both of them in there. Um, but the reality is, you no, know, look, let's just distill it down to a simple concept. Let's say you're in your house and you have your children and your wife and some people come and break in and they're going to rape your women and kill and or rape your children too. And you have a gun and you can stop them. Would Jesus say, no, do nothing, let them get raped, let them be mauled? Of course not. I, that, that, does, that doesn't, right? Okay, and keep in mind that Jesus, uh, one of the... Because these topics, you know, is, is Christianity pure passive or can you fight for yourself? These have been going around since the beginning of the church. Um, and but but the idea and amongst the leaders from Augustine to Aquinas was that just war's theory is of course um, appropriate and uh, and compa- compatible compatible with Christian teachings and mores. Um, and they would cite things like when the centurion goes to Jesus um, asking to heal his uh, his servant, and Jesus does it. And as you, as we know, every time Jesus would perform a miracle, it, it often ends up with a rebuke to the person, uh, a form of, you know, repent about X, Y, or Z. In this case, he didn't tell this centurion, oh, and by the way, now repent and stop killing people. Stop being a, a leader of this war machine that exists on violence. Um, he didn't say that. Why? Because it was understood that, that, if it, that the military and physical force were appropriate. The idea of, you know, I mean, today they've highlighted in the context of humanism, you know, the human life, uh, it's such a, you know, it's such a precious thing. And I'm not saying it's not. But back in those days, you know, we're all going to die was the logic. So if you die now or later, it was not a big deal, depending on the circumstances. So if you if killing you, ending your life now, which is going to end anyway, because you're an evildoer, that wasn't seen as some dramatic thing. And it still isn't. This is why we have execution uh, going on. So, th- so. Like I said, I believe that uh, this idea this has been promulgated recently, and it's really being backed and enforced by groups that are hostile to Christianity, and it's for the simple reason to just uh, handicap Christians and, and convince them if you're a real Christian, 
then you do nothing except be a doormat. Well, obviously, that's the greatest way to have your enemy think of themselves. Um, the last thought, Jesus, you know, you, you mentioned this, you know, uh, uh, turn the other cheek to the slap. People forget that in the only in recorded instance of Jesus getting slapped, he actually did not turn his other cheek. He challenged the man who slapped him. Uh, and this this was during his trial. Um, you know, so even so, clearly, just by Jesus' own example, this was a figurative thing about forgiveness. You know, obviously, he is stressing forgiveness and non-retaliation in that in in a personal capacity. But even when it happened to him, it wasn't obviously appropriate, and he spoke up and challenged that person. So there's definitely, uh, I think, Christians re need to really understand the concept of just war that. To be a Christian is not to be a doormat. Um, it's, it's not to be an aggressor either, obviously. Uh, that's not what I'm talking about. But in, in the confines of what we're discussing, you know, this war with Islam, all these Christians were defending, as I mentioned, against unprovoked violent Islamic assaults. When I think the other thing that you have to bring into the discussion about Jesus talking about turning the other cheek, if you look at all the context of what's being said there, he's not talking about physically being hit. He's talking about basically being backhanded. In, in, and I don't mean in a physical way, but in a verbal way where someone has taken a verbal assault against you and to not respond in kind. And then also when you, when you go back to the garden, when Peter tried to you know chop that dude's head off, the Roman centurion, and accidentally just nicked him in the ear and Jesus rebuked him. He wasn't rebuking Peter because he was being violent. He was rebuking Peter because he was being a moron. And Peter was getting in the way of what he was sent to this planet to do, which was to die on the cross and then be resurrected by God as you know propitiation for our sins and so it's like yeah it's easy to just say these stupid things out loud because they look good on a t-shirt but then when you start digging down it doesn't really go your way in terms of your argumentation but another thing that is brought up in this book is specifically in the introduction is how the west in general is refusing to recognize not just not recognize but they're refusing to recognize the threat that islam poses so i'm going to read this quote from the intro here not only has the West forgotten about Islam, it has become sympathetic to this creed that for over a millennium terrorized and negatively impacted the West's development. Everywhere the threat is real and palpable, even as a somnolent of, if not comatose West, slumbers on. And then a little bit later in the introduction, Raymond, you talk about how, how the, the West has really lost its reason to fight. Right. So so we don't recognize our enemies, but then we've lost our reason to fight. So I'll read another short quote here and then get your feedback. What did the West past possess that it's present, which seems to be far superior in every conceivable way, including military, does not? The answer is men who had something worth fighting for from their faith and family to their country and their cultures. And even just reading that out loud. Someone's going to clip that out later and say, Kyle's a Christian nationalist. He thinks we should fight for our country. We should do all these different things. And, oh, we need to conquer this group and that group, even though that's not even vaguely what, what is being communicated. But talk to me a little bit about the, the sickness in the West of, again, not even recognizing our enemy, which even Sun Tzu would tell us is a really stupid thing to do. Like if you don't know your enemy, you can't even know yourself. But then even beyond that, we just think, ah, you know, nothing's really worth fighting for. Like people, again, looking at this Hamas issue, they're just like, ah, you know, they killed over a thousand of your people and they still have a bunch of them in captivity and some of them have probably already been killed. But ah, what's the big deal, right? I'm going to go get another Starbucks drink and go play video games and then watch porn. Like that's just kind of where everybody has ended up here in the West. But go go with that yeah. wherever you want to go. Yeah, good observations. Um so I think it all it all stems down to the secularization of the West, and in as much as the West became secular and less having a faith and a heritage, it became uh, inevitably more materialistic. Okay, so the things that matter to us as a culture are purely material, and hedonism as well. Okay, so it's pleasure uh, and it's material. You know, as long as I have what I need, my food, my drink, my pleasure, my home, my fun, I'm good. Well, as it happens, those are not, and when it comes down to it, things worth dying for. And I think it's turned the West in general into, as I described in the book, in that intro quote you said, which is basically, um, you know, just this kind of propped up corpse that's feeding off itself and enjoying itself and has, and has no motivation to go on because there's nothing really there to fight for. No one wants to fight and die for gay rights. Okay? No one wants to go fight and die for all the things that they prop up and they message and tell us this is what it's all about. OK, um, those are all vices, which, you know, humans to various degrees fall into. 
Um, and but no one in his heart of heart is going to stand up and make a heroic stand for these things. So I think that's why, uh, to a large measure, the West in general is so comatose, as I said, um, and totally oblivious. And as you say, are more interested in their Starbucks and et cetera, et cetera, um, because everyone's become so insular, uh, insulated into their own little world. And to them, they and, and this and this aspect makes sense to them. They understand that the West is lost and there's very little to do, so they just worry about their own little uh, home, their own nucleus, um, you know, which makes sense, like I said. And uh, other than that, what can they do? Um, and, and now I'm talking about the more virtuous ones, which are the minority, as opposed to the majority who we were discussing earlier that are just materialistic hedonists. And that's certainly just not enough to motivate anyone. Uh, unlike, as you read in that quote about the defenders, the heroes, who, as I was saying, this is in a time when the West was so weak uh, compared to the Muslim world. But because they had things, important things, historically, the things that have always been important to people, uh, like uh, faith and family and culture and civilization and God, <clears throat> those were worth fighting for. That's why Muslims today are fighting for that, because actually, believe it or not, they, they have something to fight for, uh, something, whether whether it's right or wrong, it's still a lot more motivating than what we're told we should be fighting for. Well, and certainly, I think the idea that Christians should be violent in any way, should be muscular in any way, is anathema to a lot of people. They bought into this idea that Jesus was this hippie that just wanted everybody to have a good life and to just do their best and that it would all work out in the end. And it's like, okay, if you only look at the Lamb of God, that becomes the way that you see it. But when you look at him as fully Lamb and fully Lion, Lamb of God and Lion of Judah, you don't really get that. Because, again, you don't get that from Scripture. So it's like, where did you get that idea? It's probably because you got it from culture. You got it from frescas. You got it from these paintings that show this, like, Middle East, not a Middle Eastern Jewish guy, but kind of like a, a Danish guy with soft features. And you just really, really nice guy, blonde hair, blue eyes, somehow in the Middle East a couple thousand years ago. And it's just one of the one of those things. But to get back to this whole idea of the whole muscularity of the religion, I want to read this quote here from the introduction. For starters, it must be understood that pre-modern Christianity was for at least the first three quarters of its existence a muscular religion. Not only does recorded history, including the forthcoming one, make this abundantly clear, vestiges of the glories of Christendom still surround us. Consider the impulse of faith, of faith that erected so many massive, if not imposing, cathedrals and churches all throughout Europe. Once thundering with the booming masculine voices of confident worshipers, they are today the haunt of little old ladies lighting candles for their departed loved ones. That is, when such buildings are not actively being pawned off or donated in the name of Christian charity to Muslims who transform them into mosques. Brutal quote. And so unbelievably true. We don't build beautiful buildings anymore. We build ugly postmodern buildings. We don't go into most churches and hear the, the voices of men singing in multiple harmonies. We hear a smattering of male voices with a bunch of female voices singing songs that were written as if they are love poetry uh, or like, uh, pornographic novels to some, you know, Jesus guy, right? So it's it's this homoerotic thing that men can't really wrap their minds around. And then at the end of the day, any expression of Christianity that is masculine is automatically deemed as toxic. And again, when you look at the entirety of Christian history and when you actually read the source material and the scripture and, and the things that we're supposed to do, you don't come away knowing that. So where do you think all this comes from, Raymond? Is it just the influence of culture? Is it the secularization of the West? Is it the fact that we're basically biblically illiterate? Because even Christians that uh, say they're evangelicals, many of them don't even believe that Jesus was God. They believe that he was, you know, a created being. Like, where does this come from? Wow. <laughs> In as it's much a lot. as I agree with you, that's a, that's a lot to unpack right there. Yeah. Um, uh you know, I, I have various disjointed thoughts, which I'll just offer them. So one is, um, you know, this sort of effeminacy of Christianity, which has been imposed on it. And I'll tell you a little bit of my own personal experiences. Like I said, you know, I, I was baptized in the Orthodox Church, but I was born and raised here. So like I said, it was impossible for Western Christianity not to influence me in a, in a major way. <laughs> for the record, my brother is a, um, is a Baptist, uh, I think, minister or, or part-time minister or, or Temp, you know, not a full minister. Yeah. Um, okay, so just to give you an idea, I mean, I'm very familiar with modern Western Christianity. And when I was in my youth, 
um, I started really disliking what I thought Christianity was for this very reason. It, it just seemed so effeminate. Yeah. And I felt like to be a good Christian, I have to act like a woman, and that's what Jesus wants. And, you know, it just it was really frustrating, and I, you know, I just couldn't do it. Yeah. Um, so thankfully, that's one of the reasons I really gravitated back to a, a more traditional interpretations of Christianity, which was not that, okay? And I understood that this effeminacy that's being imposed is really a modern manifestation. One can call it a heresy. In fact, that's the idea. A heresy is you take a truth and you highlight it um, and, and conceal all the other aspects. So they've taken one aspect, which is the love and the forgiveness, uh, which, is, which is Christian, and they've just put that on a pedestal and completely obliterated the justice and the righteousness and the warfare as needed. Um, and so it's become this. And uh, the other thing I would also say, it's, it's, this, it's, I think it's part and parcel with this ongoing defeminization of society in general. Mm -hmm. And that too is, I believe, by design. Okay, if you want to conquer a land or the world or whatever, what better way can you do it than to convince the men that they're women, right? Well, whether literally as these trans and whatever, or or more or more um, frequently uh, spiritually, making mm -hmm. them making them passive and effeminate and emasculating them in that sense. And that's obviously very widespread. And so I think, you know, the, the, because it would, because there's a, a truth of a, a kernel of truth, which is the love, not being, a, not being a woman, obviously, but you know, the forgiveness it's been, and because the powers that be have been trying to emasculate and dominate Western civilization, all of that converged into what you have today, which is secular people are emasculated and Christian people think it's their job to be emasculated as well. Um, but like I said, and as you quoted from, you know, the booming cathedrals and the voices, that's not how Christianity was for century, for most of its existence. And I don't know who's going to get Christianity right, the people who are closer to the times of Christ or us who are so co completely, um, you know, separated, especially epistemologically and how we understand things. And a final observation, you know, of interest is modern day Western Christians, to them, the Old Testament is just you know, at best poetry, yeah. um, it, it holds no meaning. And as you quoted in those opening verses that I had in the book, you know, the Old Testament is very militant. Mm -hmm. And pre-modern pre Christians, uh, as the men in the book, took the Old Testament very seriously. Okay, so just, just as the Old Testament is full of warfare, righteous warfare, and defense, et cetera, et cetera, that, to them, that was Christianity as well, because it's in their holy book. Um, I, I find it strange that for us Western or modern Christians, the Old Testament is just completely, you know, has been, I understand the New Testament abrogates it in that sense, you know, because it's fulfilled it, et cetera. But I think too many people treat the Old Testament as just there's absolutely no lessons there whatsoever um, when there are, I think. Well, certainly there are. And it's interesting. If you're going to overtake a people, you need to take out the men. And how much better if you can get the men to take out themselves? So let's make our men fat. Let's make them lazy. Let's make them soft. Let's make sure their hands are soft. Let's make sure that they would never even want to hurt a fly. Let's convince them that if they did want to hurt a fly, that that would be immoral and that God would be mad at them. And so, yeah, it's it's the perfect plan if you go that route. But in the book, you highlight these men that obviously didn't go that route. Uh, again, I'll, I'll read the names here. Uh, we're only going to be able to get into one of them. Uh, that's all we're going to have time for. But Duke Godfrey, the Cid, King Richard, St. Ferdinand, St. Louis, John Hunyadi, Skanderber, Skanderbeg, I messed it up again, and Vlad Dracula. But I want to talk about King Richard. So the, the, the title of this chapter was The Lion That Roared at Islam. I, I just absolutely love that title. So uh, this is Richard the First, so Richard the Lionheart. Uh, he was a six foot five, super athletic, very handsome guy. And if you don't know a whole a lot about history, guys that grew up around the time that he grew up, there were a whole lot of dudes that were six foot five walking around. And so a lot of these guys, you know, uh, were, were very, very impressive. And, but these, these guys were all warriors, but I do want to read a quick quote from the chapter and guys, we're barely going to be able to scratch the surface on King Richard, and we're not even going to get into the other guys. You're going to have to go pick up your own copy of Defenders of the West. It will be in the show notes. You guys can check it out. But this is a quote from Richard uh, of D Divizes. Divizes? What, what, what would that be? Uh, I don't know how to pronounce uh, it. Yeah. That's good enough. Uh, it's a different Richard. So it's not King Richard, but this is a contemporary English, English uh, chronicler of Richard's life. He said this short quote, which was great. For so great were the men's, for, was the man's many strengths of body, mental, and courage, and entire trust in God. And so 
the thing is, is this was a man that was very strong, very courageous, very strong mentally. Uh, uh, but in addition to that, he put his entire trust for his life with God. And so if you would give us just a very, very brief overview of King Richard. And then I want to ask you a few things that specifically went down during his life, but how does history come to know who King Richard even is? Sure. Um, an amazing character for sure. Uh, so King Richard is, uh, he's known really, he spearheaded the third, what's called the third crusade, uh, which happens right after the fall of Jerusalem, which was a cataclysmic event, uh, the, the fall of Christian Jerusalem to Saladin's forces, uh, around 1187 or 83, uh, I think 87, sorry. Um, and, um, yeah, 87. And very, because it was such a cataclysmic movement, so lot, lots of kings and emperors, uh, joined it, including Barbarossa, who had a tragic fall and died very early before he even made it to the Holy Land. Um, but Richard and, and uh, Philip, I believe the second, there's so many Philips, I think mm -hmm. the second, uh, were, were, were the ones who really spearheaded it. But before long, Philip failed uh, from the Holy Land because was, the sufferings were too immense. Um, right when Richard got there, he, he, he immediately got a fever, and yet he was still fighting. He had his men bring him out uh, even with his fever and lay him down so he can shoot with his crossbow, mm. All right? So, and like, and as you said, very, very tall, muscular, ferocious warrior. And the reason we know this is true, because one can say, yeah, it's in the, in the, in the sources, but obviously they're exaggerating. But the Muslim sources say the same exact thing. Right. And he really terrified the Muslims. They describe him as a mountain of, of, of madness, essentially. And he would just uh, single-handedly just barge in like on his horse and just slaughter like 10 Muslims. Warriors, and these weren't weak, wimpy Muslims either. These were powerful Turks. Uh, so definitely, de definitely the most physically imposing of all the characters in the book, I would say. Um, and anyway, the, what's, it's tragic because as you read the story, you know, this is a powerful man, very charismatic. Uh, the men loved him, and he, he he did so much, and he could have done more, but it was because he was essentially betrayed by the aforementioned Philip II and his brother, John, and this is where the, the Robin Hood legend, of course, comes in, where King John, along with uh, Philip, um, scheme to basically uh, subvert and take over England for John and portions of what we call France that belonged to Richard at the time. Uh, so, you know, th think about it. Here's a, so here's a, here's a classic example. Here's a king who sold so much and raised so much money just to go to the Holy Land and fight, and he knew the risk he's taking. And he almost lost everything. Um, and he didn't even, even when he when he learned what was happening uh, in England, and it would obviously behoove him to go there. He still waited uh, and risked it. Um, and then uh, and, and, he, and then he goes with other adventures, just trying to get back and gets thrown in jail, et cetera, et cetera. So he's the prime example of the of the sort of motivation and and what motivated these men who just risked everything for an ideal. Uh, whereas today, and you know, let's go back to your earlier observation, we don't do that because we don't have ideals. We're just mm. materialists. So, you know, our, our ideals are the now, you know, satisfy me and that's it. There's nothing to fight for or die for. Um, so that's his story really. And, you know, there's, I, I can give you more details if I think you were going to ask me as well, but um, it's, well, it's, it's I, I, yeah, go ahead. No, we'll certainly get into more details, but I do want to kind of put a finer point on what you just said. Again, back in those days, even kings didn't have nearly as, as many possessions as we have. Uh, most human yeah. beings have thousands, if not tens of thousands, of individual possessions, whereas that's not really something that is known outside of modernity. And these were men that some of them had tremendous wealth, but they would pay for their soldiers to live and to eat on their own dime, right? And so this was something that was very important for a lot of people to understand. But you did say this briefly, and I, gosh, I'm setting you up with all these huge topics that you only get a, a few uh, minutes maybe to talk about. But you said that Richard was very important to the Third Crusade. There is a lot of confusion over the Crusades. You talked about it just a little bit earlier. People don't know why they were fought. They thought they think when you say the Crusades, that's like saying World War II or the Vietnam War, like it was this one thing that happened at this one time period, and they just so happened to call it the Crusades. It wasn't something that happened multiple times over multiple generations for multiple different reasons involving multiple different people, even though the two sides basically stayed the same. But could you give us just a very basic overview? Like treat us all like we're five. How would you explain to a five-year-old the, the the Crusades, why they were fought? You know, how did it even get to a third one? How did it go beyond a third one? Just a basic overview. Absolutely. 
Um, so the problem with the Crusades is how historians today present it. Mm -hmm. And that is to say, they present it in a vacuum. Okay. In other words, all of a sudden you have four Islam, as I mentioned, you know, Muhammad dies around 632, and that's when the jihad begins. And the first crusade is called in 1095. Okay. So we have over 400 years uh, passing. And the problem is historians don't talk about those 400 years. They act like everything was normal. Everything was fine until in 1095, these evil, uh, I always, I, I quote John Esposito, a professor at Georgetown University, uh, where I also went for a while, who says, you know, four centuries of peace elapsed before a papal power play led to these tragic events known as the Crusades, which have led to distrust, the, mm -hmm. uh, lasting mistrust between Muslims and Christians, et cetera. And there's a lot of more, mo mo a lot more historians who say that. Well, as it happens, if you go back four centuries after Muhammad died in 632, um, the jihad was declared on infidels, which mostly happened to be Christians because that's who were surrounding uh, Arabia at the time. And long story short, by 732, one century after Muhammad's death, Islam had conquered all of North Africa from Morocco to Egypt, all of the Middle East. Uh, every country you can imagine that modern, it was known as gr greater Syria, but it encompassed Lebanon and Israel and Jordan and, and so forth. And later, of course, uh, Asia Minor under the Turks. And much later, I'll get to that, of course, after the Crusades, the Balkans and so forth. And then, uh, and, uh, you know, so they were in the middle of France, the Muslims, doing the same sorts of things ISIS does, okay, that we're told Islam, Muslims does, do not do, but on a mm -hmm. grand scale, because these weren't just a handful of terrorists on a pickup drug, these were the caliphates and the sultanates. You know, the sources talk of hundreds of thousands of jihadis oftentimes. It was a mass migration as well mm. uh, into Europe. So, it was, And Spain, of course, was conquered and have since from 711 and you know held for centuries of warfare, the, the Reconquista, we could talk about that. But so, and in, the, in these four centuries, Christians not only were being conquered, but the atrocities that were being committed against them, like I said, make what ISIS does look like child play, at least at least the quantity, because it was right. much more, okay? And uh, the and Europe was continuously bombarded. You know, when we think of Europe or Christendom, we think of Europe. Uh, really, in the seventh century before all this began, it was North Africa right. and the Middle East and Europe, and most of Christianity was in North Africa right. and the Middle East. That's why Constantine moved the emperor at, at the capital to uh, Byzant uh, the little Greek town Byzantium in Asia Minor, and all the all the early councils and so forth, and all the leading theologians were from Africa, Egyptians, you know, Augustine's from uh, Hippo, which is uh, Tunisia or Algeria, I think Algeria, and so forth. So all of that, you know, it, think of the historical amnesia, was conquered, wrested away from the rest of Christendom, which was now Europe proper. And that was embattled and battered for centuries by the forces of Islam, who were still trying to conquer them, just like they had conquered their uh, religious counterparts of North Africa and the Middle East. Okay, so that's the backdrop of the Crusades. Now, mm -hmm. fast forward a little closer, I mentioned the Turks. They start coming into the scene in the 10th and 11th century, 9th century, and they become, for long, they're, they're converts to Islam, and now they're the champion bearers, the standard bearers of jihad, literally. Okay, they are very... Uh, they, they took the concept and the duty of jihad more literally because they're, and this is another topic we can get into because all the people who converted to Islam were tribal and Islam is a tribal religion. Okay. It's us versus them, the infidel. Uh, so it comports so easily with the tribal or Bedouin mindset already. And that's the genius of Muhammad. He was a tribal Bedouin and he founded a religion that's based on his understanding of the world. Um, at any rate, right now in the years before the crusade, you have Asia Minor and the, and the Eastern Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, com under complete attack by the Seljuk Turks. And the sources talk about, contemporary sources, um, the, the atrocities being committed in, uh, to the Armenians, especially, you know, when you, when you talk about the uh, Turkish genocide of Armenians, we think it's in the 1800s and early 1900s. It actually goes back a thousand years earlier. Mm -hmm. And the sources talk about tens of thousands of Armenians just being slaughtered, enslaved. Um, churches everywhere being set on fire, turned into stables for horses, turned into mosques, um, and the rest of it, and also Greeks, the further west into Asia Minor. So, you know, Turkey, we, we know the country Turkey, people forget, this is one of the absolute oldest regions of Christianity. This is where St. Paul wrote most of his letters hmm. to that area, and of course, it was transformed through extreme violence and force. And, and 
and also at the same time, because pilgrimages to the Holy Land from Europe were always a continuous thing, and they were always fraught with dangers uh, from the surrounding Muslims, who were usually content uh, to harass and extort and take money with, you know, the criminality sort of limited, thanks to the reigning caliph or whoever. But under the Seljuks, it got really bad and extreme, with, and the violence, and one source talks about, you know, um, a group of nuns under who went there uh, under, as part of a larger caravan that contained men, and they all got attacked. And one nun, because she was pretty, was gang raped um, and then slaughtered. So that that's the build up to the crusade. And then the Eastern Emperor, who's involved in all this, the Roman Emperor Byzantine Alexius, called for aid uh, from the West and saying, you know, this is <laughs> we need some help. And that's when Pope Urban II in uh, the Council of Clermont in ninety five detailed everything that I just told you. So he also knew and detailed what was happening uh, to Eastern Christians. And that completely infuriated the Franks, as they were known, uh, you know, the, the, the Europeans, mostly from what we call France today, but all around Europe. And that was the beginning of the First Crusade. It was understood as an altruistic endeavor to, it, it was the, the verse that was often quoted was, you know, love God with all your heart and love your fellow man. And loving God, you had to go and, and liberate the Holy Sepulchre which is where Christ was buried and resurrected, and the Holy Land in general, and loving your fellow man is you have to go and protect these Eastern Christians. So that, in a nutshell, is the is is the motivation that propelled the Crusades. Um, and that, and as you said, you know, yeah, historians and the way we talk about Crusades as if they're just like a one, like a World War II, they're not. And and there's and there's you know manifestations of similar types of Crusades. You can say well before this. You know, the Eastern Roman emperors, the Byzantines, in sword and scimitar, I talk, I talk about a couple of them, Nic Nicephorus Focus, uh, and, and to him, you know, his wars against Muslims were holy wars. You know, they weren't called crusades, but obviously they were under the same impetus of logic. So this has been going on for a long, long time. Um, you know, you can take it, and, and it went on much later. Uh, you know, George Bush once called what happened in, uh, you know, I don't know if it was Iraq or Afghanistan, he was calling it a crusade. Um, and then he had to apologize yeah. because all those evil, terrible crusades, uh, you know. But in a sense, he was correct uh, in the sense that this is part of the continuity of Islam versus the West. It's certainly a continuity of that. And again, we have so many things we need to pay attention to. The the news cycle moves so fast. The biggest story today by next Tuesday will not be big and no one will be talking about it anymore. And we just move so quickly. So the idea that you could go back and go over hundreds of years of history of a particular area seems crazy. And so uh, that's why I'm so thankful for books like Defenders of the West and Sword and Scimitar, because it helps you kind of slow down and understand what was happening, even though these books are just basic overviews of battles and basic overviews of people. But King Richard... He was on the crusade and he finally made it to Jerusalem. And I want to talk quickly about the siege of Jerusalem that he led. And here's a quick quote from the book. On first seeing the holy city from a distance, Richard, it is relayed, began to weep in anguish and begged God to shield it from his sight until and unless he liberated it. So that kind of gives you a sense of what it was like for this man to see this area, to see it under Muslim control, to understand all the atrocities that went into them taking control of this area, and then feeling this deep level of, uh, I guess, guidance towards the goal of liberating the city. So how did the siege, how did King Richard's siege of Jerusalem go? Well, actually, it did it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, on, on two occasions. Richard and his men finally made it because after Jerusalem was conquered by Saladin, all the adjoining Christian territories, most of them were also conquered. So they had to start piecemeal from the coast. And um, they had to actually, to he, his, the final decision, which was uh, given to him by the most experienced and veteran fighters of the military orders, the Templars and Hospitallers, was don't do it. Don't it, but we can't do it now because it just logistically would be impossible. They did not have... Uh, supply train to the, 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 the coastal area w where they did have control of um, and it, it infuriated a lot of his men and eventually many of them walked away and left him uh, and others didn't they saw the logic so he was so this is also interesting about Richard's character and as much as he was a fiery warlord he was prudent enough not to go into battle when he knew it was a lost cause and right. the sources talk about how he was more careful about his men's life than his own mm -hmm. and you know he wouldn't risk their lives and he wouldn't do it and, then, and when they when they got angry, he said, you know what, I'll go with you, but I'm not leading it. I'm not leading it because I know it's, it's going to end badly. Someone else can lead it. Uh, 
so, but he did, you know, another, another very remarkable feat of Richard is uh, <clears throat> the siege of Jaffa. So one of the cities that he liberated is Jaffa. And uh, then it would, when, he, when he was somewhere else, Saladin come, came and completely conquered it. And again, the, uh, the atrocities they committed to the Christians there, <clears throat> beggar description, you know, including saying, you know, lying and telling them, you know, uh, you can surrender peacefully. And then once they open the doors, they, they cruelly torture them and disembowel them things of that nature. And Richard was now actually on his way back to England because as, as I said, he was, uh, his uh, John and so forth were subverting England and he was finally on, about to go and word came to him saying well, what happened in Jaffa. And he just uh, stopped everything, fled to Jaffa. And when he reached there by boat and he saw it completely surrounded by Muslims, including Saladin. And uh, he actually, <laughs> he just jumped half armed into the water holding a crossbow with one hand and I think a sword in the other or a battle axe and just charged alone, which of course motivated that he had about 2000 crew members uh, to do the same thing. And they, and that just, and the Turks, you know, they fought, but it so terrified them yeah. and he completely routed them and Saladin, the great Saladin fled. Okay. And, and you know, the descriptions are all there in the book. Primary sources. Well, very, I actually. Very, very, where's the movie for this? You know. Okay. The, no, there's so much. That's why I wanted to talk about King Richard so much is because this should be a movie, and this really wanted to. This gets into something that I wanted to ask you about because, as you talked about, Richard was feared to an extreme degree that we can't even fully comprehend by the Muslims, and he had consistently beaten down groups that outnumbered his Christian troops. You know, five to one, ten to one. Uh, he was seen as very bold, very capable, very deadly. But there's a story in the book uh, where there were some truce talks going on between the Muslim leader Saladin and Richard. And at the time, Saladin was unwilling to meet with Richard on the field and pitch battle because, you know, he was terrified of him. But Saladin found out that King Richard and some of his men were camped outside of Jaffa and Saladin and his crew uh, launched a surprise attack to try and take him out. So here's a quote from the book. Hearing the cries from his tent, the king was roused and leapt in great alarm from his bed. Putting on his mail shirt of unbreakable mesh, he ordered his knights to arise without delay. Even as the Muslims rushed in with horrible shouts and then began to howl and fire javelins, darts, and arrows very densely, crying, everything is bearable for those of manly character. Awesome quote. I'll read it again. Everything is bearable for those of manly character. Richard, at the head of ten hurriedly horsed knights, charged powerfully into the thick of the enemy, emptying saddles of their riders and transfixing some of them. Their initial impact was so great, and their violent spirit carried them through all the Turkish lines as far as the last. As you mentioned, I think in the intro of this book, there's a reason, and it's not because it's not interesting, there's a reason why we don't have movies uh, about these guys that, you know, musicals haven't been written about these people's exploits. It's because of the foundation of it. It's because people are really, really awkward about, you know, violent Christianity. They're really, really awkward. They don't want to piss off Muslims. You know, they're they're totally fine to just rout Christians and say they're the worst people on the planet, but they would never say that about Muslims because they're scared of them. But when you have stories like this, that's just one of the many stories from Richard's life that are like this. And they were written by people that were with him, right? So it wasn't like one of these things where it's like 700 years later, like with Alexander including the Great. Muslims. <laughs> exactly. Including Muslims. And they yeah. hated him so much, but they revered him. And that's, that's the thing that I found compelling about your book is you talked about both sides. Like, look, if you just took the Christian's accounts, maybe you could look at them skeptically. But even the Muslims looked at men like King Richard and said, God, I hate him, but like, you know, Allah helped my hands to defeat him. But my goodness, this dude is a gangster. I mean, just I'll it's you, so incredible. <laughs> I'll give you a final anecdote there that really yeah. underscores uh, Richard um, and shows you that till today, he is the most recognized, feared and hated of all crusaders in the Muslim world. Muslims, of course, are familiar with the crusades in general. Um, when I was born, my parents, uh, their, their, their first names both started with an R. And they decided to name all their kids uh, with a name with an R. Mm. And I was the third to be born. <clears throat> and at the time, they were actually going to name me Richard. Um, they back, back then, they would do this practice where you put a candle with names and whichever mm. candle lasts the longest, that's the name. And I think it was Richard. Um, but at the final moment, uh, my dad said no, because we might return to Egypt. And if this guy's named Richard, they're going to kill him. Oh, okay. oh no. <laughs> and, hey. but, but, that, but they named me Ray 
which is another crusader name, and they didn't know it, and they didn't recognize it. So it just shows you the singular power of the name Richard till this very day um, in, in the Muslim world. Right. It just carries that connotation with it. And, and again, we're, we're kind of winding to a close here. And so we got to, you know, kind of wrap up Richard's life. But as you mentioned earlier, he was betrayed uh, by a fellow crusader. He was betrayed by his brother. Um, and this is a guy that, as you talk about in the, in the book, during a lot of these battles, he would have arrows all over him. Right. I think the way you talked about it in the book was like, you know, it stuck out like spikes of a hedgehog. Right. And so but there was one particular guy that shot him with an arrow. He goes to pull the arrow out. It gets infected. It got gangrenous. Uh, and that really w- led to eventually his death and his plight. But I do want to read at the end. And actually, I want to read this one little part because apparently his sister was a gangster as well. Because I think <laughs> the the guy who shot the arrow at him was brought to like his deathbed. If I'm just trying to remember from memory, was brought to his deathbed and he forgave the man. And he basically right. sent him off and you know wished him well. But apparently his sister... Uh, I'll read it here. Alas for the archer, however, after Richard died, his enraged sister, Joan, uh, had the man skinned alive and torn apart by wild horses. So apparently she wasn't as forgiving as her brother. So that's one thing. But I have to read this last thing because I thought you did a very poetic job of summarizing King Richard and in, in how he should be remembered. Thus, King Richard I died on April the 6th of 1199 at the age of 42. In his brief life, he was the archetypal medieval warrior king and chivalrous knight par excellence, evidenced in part by the fact that his moniker, Lionheart, lives on to this day. He sacrificed and risked much in his crusade and went against all odds. At a time when the crusader states were on the verge of collapsing, Richard cowed the forces of Islam, retook several cities and castles, and gave the Christians the much-needed breathing space to regroup and refortify. His capture of Cyprus was, moreover, a milestone for crusading. So near to the Middle East, it became for centuries the chief base of resources to supply the coastal crusader kingdoms. It was where every future crusader stopped before entering into the lion's den of Islam. Indeed, until this day, it is the name of Richard that most personifies the archetypal crusader enemy in the popular Muslim consciousness, a testimony to the havoc he wrought single-handedly. That goes back, Raymond, to what you talked about, that if your name was Richard and your family moved back to Egypt, that was going to be a major, major problem for you. But before I ask you uh, about another one of your other works, is there anything that you want to say to put a bow on King Richard? Yeah, it's not a bow, though. It's um, how he's understood today. Mm. And I get a little bit into that in the conclusion of the book. Um, For all that we said about him and his persona and 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 the manly man that he was, you know, a man's man. Uh, today, in your average scholarly academic book, if you encounter Richard, he's portrayed as, um, you know, a, a tyrant, of course, mm-hmm. um, a, who doesn't know what he's doing. He's, he's reckless. He goes to the Holy Land and he should be taking care of his own kingdom. He's a bad father, a bad son. I, I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing a famous historian that I quote in the book. And most recently, he's this homosexual. Okay? Yeah. Uh, so today, it's very common in movies. Richard is, 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 is a secret closet homosexual. Um, there's absolutely zero. Uh, where they get that from is because in the sources, it talks about how he slept in the same bed with King Philip when they were young. Um, but because homosexuality was so divorced from pre-modern men's minds, they didn't need to clarify what that meant because it was very common for young men and young women to sleep separately in the same, in the same beds. All right? and, uh, and they also cite that he didn't have a son um, so I guess every barren man is a homosexual yeah. by that logic. And, but they inconveniently ignore that he had a, a bastard for an illegitimate son. Uh, so, and that when he was dying, he asked for women, a woman or women to be brought to <laughs> comfort him. Uh, so the point is, uh, you can see the powers that be once again, not only ignoring someone like Richard, but they've turned him into the exact opposite. They've really turned him into some contemptible thing that's not heroic that's not worth looking up to he's a bad christian of course because he was violent uh and and that's and and that applies to really all of them in the book and i I, I talk about that at greater length because i think i think it's important to understand how they were seen compared to how they're seen today 
Well, Raymond, I guess we can all look forward to the Netflix, uh, you know, series made about Richard where he's going to be a black lesbian. And so I'm very, very excited <laughs> about that. Uh, you know, Netflix always does great with that. Sure. But um, I, I feel a little bit sheepish bringing this up here at the end because it's such an important topic. But as with most of our conversation today, Raymond, every single question could have been like a series of podcasts. But you did a work back in 2013 called Crucified Again, Exposed Islam's New War or Exposing Islam's New war on Christians. And so this book details the not just oppression, but the systematic oppression and murder of Christians all over the Muslim world. And this is not talked about ever. It's not just not talked about enough. It's not talked about ever. Here recently in Nigeria, there was the systematic killing of Christian villagers by Muslims. Why did they do that? Because they were Christians. That's why these people needed to die because they were Christ followers. And again, the West we're kind of lulled to sleep. I live in Oklahoma. If I trip and fall, I'm going to land on three different churches, right? You know, that's just basically the, the the world that I live in. But when you go to places like Nigeria or Eritrea or North Korea or Syria or China or any of these places where being a Christian actually costs you something and it might, might be your head, we can't even fathom what this looks like, but the overwhelming majority of violence perpetrated against Christians because they are Christians on this planet comes from Muslims and no one is talking about it. Now, obviously it's for the reasons that we talked about earlier, which is we don't want to piss off the Muslims and well, you don't really understand. But at some point, Raymond, I feel like we just need to take these Muslims at their word that the reason they're killing these people is because they're Christians. The reason they hate us is because they hate us. It's not because of our foreign policy. It's not because we didn't give enough aid to a particular country at a particular time. It's because they've been bred to hate us and they do. So you detail it in the book, what's going on. Uh, give us an idea of, of what this looks like and what, if anything, we're able to do about it. Yeah, um, the, the twin topic that I focus on, aside from history of Islam and Christianity, is the modern day persecution of Christians, um, which I still follow. I write a report about it every month. Um, you know, all the, all the, that's how many there are. There's usually a, one or two dozen anecdotes of extreme savage violence against Christians, again, by, just by Muslims, even though it's, it's happening in other countries and uh, civilizations. As well, you know, your point about being in the West and falling over churches and not understanding, you know, this is, again, part of uh, an aspect of how, you know, we're very, we're, we live in a bubble. We don't know the real world. Okay. Uh, you know, a report just came out recently from Open Doors, which is a reputable international human rights organization. And it documents that there's 385 Christians around the world who are being persecuted as we speak. And that sounds like a story you might hear on the news, right? 385 million. Um, what you mentioned in Nigeria, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, people got wind of it because it happened on Christmas uh, Christmas Day. Something like uh, 100 uh, Christians were slaughtered. Yeah, it was over well, several actually, days, right around Christmas. Yeah. But that's the daily thing. That's uh, I've been, Like I said, I've been following it for years. That's been going on. Every, every month in Nigeria, maybe a couple of hundred Christians are slaughtered or burned alive by Muslims screaming jihad. And as you said, yeah, the entire conflict is the religious aspect. And, you know, when it gets really bad and, uh, and, the, and the mainstream media deigns to talk about it, the, the religious aspect is completely gone. So you right. talk about tribesmen who are being driven by climate change uh, onto the lands of farmers who are Christians. And that's why they're, they're fighting and killing each other. And again, you know, it's total, complete nonsense. Which, and why? Because, you know, you said we don't want to offend the Muslims. I think more it's more important than that. It's the narrative. Christians are right. the evil guys. Sure. They are never victims. And the Muslims are the good guys. All right. I'll give you a final a quick example. Well, to really highlight before that. your example, it's even dumber than that, Raymond. It's that Christians are the white ones and the Muslims are the brown ones. Even though people like <laughs> yeah. look at this situation in Nigeria, it is very dark complected black people killing very dark complected black people it has nothing to yeah. do with the level of melanin in their skin. No. It has to do with the ideology no. that is driving their hands. But go ahead. Well, well, and that, no, that's a good point because, and I, I often discuss this, you know, like the, the cops in Egypt are persecuted, the Assyrians in Iraq and Syria and, and, and all in, in Indonesia. And those, if you look at them, they're no different than their Muslim counterparts. You sure. can't tell them apart except for their religion. They right. speak the same language, have the same names often, live in the same culture, and they're being attacked and killed. That really underscores that the reason is their religious identity. There's nothing else. It's not a territorial dispute. It's not a grievance, as we're often told. 
It's just that they are Christian infidels. Um, and uh, I don't know. There was so much. I don't know what I was going to. Oh, I was going to give you an example. Oh, yeah. I'll, ta- I'll let, we can cap it off with this final example. So, as you recall, in 2019, I think March 15th, um, an Australian man entered into two mosques in New Zealand and shot them up, right. killed 51 worse persons. Right. Clearly a bad thing. Horrible. Right? And the world, the world stood up and condemned it, rightfully so. And we heard, and we, and we heard so much about it, how horrible it is. To the point that the UN designated March 15th, the date of this attack, as uh, Combat Islamophobia Day. Okay. Now, here's the problem with that. I, and I wrote an article where I did a study, and right around the same time that that one attack happened, and I don't remember an attack before it or after it. Okay. So it's pretty singular. Um, something I, I, I chronicled, I don't know, a dozen attacks on churches by Muslims. Where if you kind of when you add them all up, it was a th- about a thousand Christians were killed, and this was in different countries, different uh, nationalities were involved, which does underscore something endemic. You know, this isn't just an aberration; it happened in various countries, different cultures. Uh, you know, that if you say this country has a that grievance, well, that one doesn't. So why are they all attacking, burning churches? And yet you don't hear about it in the news. And where's our, you know, combat anti-Christian day or, or combat Christian? Before? Why didn't the UN declare something? I mean, this is uh, 20 times the number of dead Christians. So that's, I think that really helps you understand what's going on. That This topic, is in the, Christians are not supposed to learn, know about this. Uh, let them live in their la-la land in the West where they think everything's fine. While the rest of the Christians outside are being persecuted. Um, in ways that are, you know, just like the, 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 the early Roman persecutions. So it's not different. And it's happening. And again, it's mostly in the Muslim world. So that report that came out about 385 million Christians being persecuted, um, it lists the top 50. And something like 38, I counted them, are Muslim. Uh, okay, so which is like almost 80%. So you can say almost like 80% of the, of the persecution is being done at the hands of Muslims. Um, so, and that's why, you know, to be honest with you, that's another reason I find the writing about history refreshing because I'm so tired of writing about Christians getting trampled on in the modern era and I do enjoy reading and writing about Christians in the past who actually fought back and did something about it. When I think the one thing is guaranteed <clears throat> if you're a Christian in this world you're not guaranteed an easy life actually it's quite the contrary uh, persecution is coming your way now in America persecution might be you get an Instagram jail because you shared a scripture over the top of you know somebody's LGBTQ post right that's our level of persecution but it's good for us to understand as Christians here in the West here in America in relatively safe environments as of right now to know that there are other people that are sacrificing way more because they are risking their lives and the lives of everyone in their family because they have a copy of the Gospel of John hidden in a place in their house. And if it's found, they're going to kill them all in the streets as an example to everyone else around them that don't you believe in this Christianity stuff again. But the Holy Spirit will not be denied. God will not be denied. So many Muslims have been converted to faith in Christ through their dreams. And so it's not a uh, missionary going over there and handing them a sandwich and giving them a bottle of water. It's Jesus coming to them in their dreams. And so it's just undeniable. But Raymond, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I really enjoyed digging into your work over the last several weeks, but that's all for me. Is there anything else you want to get off your chest? Yeah, actually, one little, since we're talking about Defenders of the West, and since some of your viewers might want to get it, mm. um, it actually sold out recently, right, all okay. over the place, including on Amazon. And But but if you go on Amazon, there's a copy being sold for like $50, it's right. not even the publisher, it's like a second seller. Um, I recommend if anyone wants it, just wait a little bit, and the hardcover or, or another version, a much cheaper version, should be available, hopefully in a few days. Okay, and that would also be through their Amazon uh, link, it'll just be like a yeah. different source? Yeah, if you go now, it's a different source that's not the publisher, and it's gotcha. exorbitantly priced, like fifty dollars. Yeah, I think it's fifty usually bucks. Usually sells for yeah, usually sells for like twenty something, um, and then it is from the publisher. It's the authoritative version. So just uh, uh, it, it, it'll, it'll be clear because even if you go now, that this you know this non-authoritative version, it's not being sold through Prime. It's kind of like even hard to get it. But if it be, so, just give it a few days, I think, and it'll, it should be fine. I think by the time this comes out, it should be squared away. So guys, if you're going into the show notes, which I highly recommend that you do for the Amazon link, make sure it's, you know, got the prime click, make sure it's like, you know, $26.99 or whatever it says on here. I can't even see it. But anyway, really enjoy the time. Raymond Ibrahim, thank you for coming on a Daunted Life of Man's podcast. Happy to do it, Kyle. Thanks for having me on.
There you go, guys. Hope you enjoyed my time with Raymond Ibrahim. But before we let you go, we are going to do a quick resilience boost. At Undaunted Life, our mission is equipping men to push back darkness with content that forges spiritual, mental, and physical resilience. So the two links I've got for you today is I've got Amazon links to Sword and Scimitar and Defenders of the West. And guys, by now, I know he mentioned at the end there that the Amazon link was all messed up and it was being sold by a different seller. That should be all fixed now, but I definitely think it's well worth your time to go and pick up both books. You can do that here in the show notes. Thank you guys so much for listening to this episode. Wherever you're listening to this, please subscribe, rate, and leave us a positive five-star review. If you want me to come speak live at your event or on your podcast, just shoot me an email to info at undaunted.life. That's I-N-F-O at undaunted.life. Follow us on Instagram and like us on Facebook and check out our website for everything else, including how to donate to keep more content like this coming your way. Just go to www.undaunted.life. And also we want to thank the band Holy Name for allowing us to use their music for our content. The music on this podcast is their song Perpetual. Petua, which is off their self-titled debut album on Face Down Records. The links are in the description. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Remember, keep pushing back darkness, keep forging spiritual, mental, and physical resilience, keep seeking the Lion of Judah.